Ah, uh, summertime in the Rockies. Fresh fallen snow. Just love it. Only 185 more days until Christmas. If your Christmas tree is still up at this point, I would just go ahead and leave it up and uh, be ready for uh, a great Christmas uh, uh, celebration. I'm going to start off today with a little bit of a controversial subject, if that isn't controversial enough. The issue I have has caused division amongst homes, it's caused arguments amongst spouses, it has caused division even in the church. That is artificial Christmas trees versus real. I think it's important that we establish our position, that we make a public declaration of really where we come from on this issue. So all those that have real Christmas trees, live ones in their home, please raise your hand. Amen. Thank you. All those that have artificial trees, please raise your hand. Thank you. Well, all I know is I saw several of you raising both hands, and in our culture, we call that the swing vote. You're on both sides of the aisle, so I appreciate that. But um, I was just wondering, and this might be a real stretch for you, can, can you just reach across the chasm, reach across the aisle right now and greet somebody here this morning that may not share that same belief that you do, and just tell them good morning? Well, we'll say good morning. <laughs> hey, are you doing the benediction at the end? At the very end, yes. Would you mind reading verses 20 and 21, the final Ephesians, now to him who's able to do immeasurably as part of the benediction? Well, regardless of your political position on artificial versus real Christmas trees, one thing that um, trees in your home all share in common is all it takes is a small pet, a busy toddler, or even a clumsy adult for the tree to fall over. Why? It's simple. They're not rooted into anything. So today we're going to be looking at whether you're rooted or whether you're in a rut. So would you pray with me this morning as we uh, begin our uh, sermon? God Almighty, you've created everything. You brought each of us here for a special purpose today. It's not a coincidence who you're sitting next to. It's not luck that you made it here safely. Lord, I call upon you to open our hearts, to open our minds, to be ready to be filled with the Holy Spirit, ready to receive your word. Drown out all those distractions we have from the week, from today, from right now. We praise you today for the gift of our family, of our friends, of our community. We confess, Lord, that more often we are worried about ourselves and our plans versus others and your plans. Thank you for the way you reveal yourself. You reveal yourself through nature, through your word. Thank you for the direct revelation of your scripture. Thank you for the assurance that you hear our prayers. Lord, we don't have to stick something on an altar and hope that you hear. We have the hope in Christ. Thank you for the relationship that you have so freely and graciously offered each of us. Amen. Well, good morning. Um, many of you know me already, but I'm Garrett Doyle. I'm one of the elders here at the church. As you know, uh, Pastor Len's been uh, busy the last several years working on his uh, doctorate degree over at Denver Seminary. And so part of that uh, program, he's now to the place where he is writing his uh, thesis. And so part of that is uh, we're going to have him take one week per month to work on his writing and research researching uh, for that. So um, I have the privilege this morning of sharing with you uh, from Ephesians uh, chapter 3. Um, we're going to be continuing our series on my part in God's plan to change the world. So 
So we're going to read this passage aloud, and um, it's, you can find it in the a Pew Bible in front of you. It's on page 815. You can also look it up in your Bible. Um, I'll be reading from the NIV version, and we will also project it on the screen so you can follow along. But I would invite you to stand with me as I read uh, these uh, seven verses um, out loud. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, please be seated. I loved the last two verses that Connie uh, read as we started the service off. I guess that was out of the message, maybe, or out of the ESV. What a, what a, uh, a great enlightening way to look at that great benediction. Well, our culture often has reduced the Bible to a lot of rules and regulations, allegoric tales, and ancient poetry, and um, you know whether that's the Ten Commandments, or whether it's the story or the account of Noah's and the Ark, or whether it's the Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Really, they've kind of reduced it to a bunch of thou shouts and thou don'ts and do nots, but the Bible is not a disjointed collection of literature. It is the story of God's relationship to the world, the human race. The New Testament book of Ephesians is an epistle, and that's just a fancy word for a letter. And that's where we're going to be continuing to study this morning. So when I read the passage, I'm really reading somebody else's mail. Kind of fun. A personal communication between the real historic individual, Paul, and some of his friends, the people at the church of Ephesus. So let's kind of set the stage just a little bit. Who is Paul? Well, he is known by his Jewish name of Saul, and he is a first century and first generation Christ follower. He would, we just call him a Christian, first generation Christian. So what's his situation? Well, we, uh, we all know, or may, many of us know, the full account of Paul's life. We won't have time to dive into that today, but we're catching up in the, in the account right now where he's in prison. He's locked up for stirring up the religious community. So how does he react? He gets on his knees, and he prays for his friends. Is this simply just one of those life lessons that says, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade? I was trying to figure out who I was going to squeeze it over their head as, a, as illustration. I don't know who's closest in the front. But we live in a culture that's frankly obsessed with pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Honestly, I don't know what a bootstrap is. <laughs> and if I did have one, I'm not sure how I'd pull myself up. But the question I have is, who do you call out to for help? When trouble brews... How do you respond? Do you yell, hey, Siri? I was just wondering if anybody's phones were going to go off. <laughs> or maybe you go on and search on Google and, and type uh, the answer, uh, look for the answer. That, uh, we call Google the source of all knowledge, right? Or, you know, maybe if it's uh, more serious, you pick up the phone and you call 911. 911. Maybe we won't hear from 911 today. 911, what's your emergency? Okay, there we go. I just wanted to make sure we heard from them. So what does Paul do? Paul gets down on his knees. He gets down on his knees and prays. Think about how often do you get down on your knees? 
It's not something we do very often in our culture. It's uncomfortable to be on your knees. It's probably uncomfortable to have you watch me be on my knees. You know, think about the times you might get on your knees. Maybe it's when you're looking in your uh, girlfriend's eyes and asking for her hand in marriage, right? That might be one time. Another time might be uh, when the grandfather gets down on his knees to get on the eye level with that toddler so that they can uh, play. I've heard accounts of s- some of the guys that do that here in our uh, children's ministry. What a, what a gift of them getting down on their knees to, to humbly engage with that toddler. Well, kneeling was not simply customary or traditional for that culture, for Paul. In fact, it was really quite the opposite. When a Jewish... Uh, Uh, a man was going to pray, he would stand up and he would probably maybe even outstretch his arms uh, to God. We really don't need to be a Greek scholar because I sure am not one to understand the humble approach that Paul takes in this prayer by kneeling. So the question is, why does Paul kneel? Well, let's look at verse uh, 14. And verse 14 says, for this reason I kneel before the Father. Well, that was a head-scratcher for me. (laughs) What was the reason? (laughs) Well, we actually have to go back. And this isn't a cue cue for Nathan to go back. This is really a cue for him to go to the next slide. (laughs) But the next slide is uh, uh, Ephesians 3.1. So you go back to verse 1. It says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, Jesus... Uh, Jesus Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. So Paul is getting on his knees for the sake of the Gentiles. Remember... Paul is a Roman, he's Jewish, and now he's talking about uh, doing this for the sake of the Gentiles. Uh, you may remember from a few weeks ago when we described, uh, when uh, we, we heard from, I think it was Pastor Tim that talked about uh, gen- uh, Jews describing Gentiles as dogs. Was that right, Tim? And um, this is kind of the, uh, the, you know, it's a very derogatory t- uh, term that they were using for each other. Um, I would suggest that some of the same type of rhetoric we hear today in the social media between uh, uh, political parties when they describe each other, they say uh, very uh, demeaning uh, uh, things. But he has a genuine love and concern. And this genuine love and concern was really a threat to the societal order of the time. However, Paul's desire was more than just unification. He wasn't just trying to get people to come together. It was a desire for them, for everyone to experience the hope of Christ. We sang about that just a few songs back, that absolute hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Paul was on a mission and wanted everyone to be rooted in the love of Christ. In fact, Paul was a missionary and he was out spreading the gospel, delivering this message to anyone and everyone that would hear it. Paul's approach to God was humble. We've kind of talked about that. But Paul was also desperate. Desperate because he knew it would take God's power, not his own. Why? He was stuck in jail. He couldn't get out. He was desperate. He needed help in order to make this happen. So what is your approach to God? I don't know if you normally take notes during the sermon or how you uh, try to remember what has been uh, delivered in the message, but today I would like you to write down just four words. So um, on the back of your bulletin, if you, uh, uh, all you need to do is leave room for four different words. If you'd rather do it on your phone, I won't judge you that you're texting if you want to take notes that way. But if you would just write down four words today, and the first, four, uh, first of those words is approach. So write in big, nice big words, leaving room for the other three. But Paul's approach to God was humble, it was selfless, and it was desperate. So after examining Paul's approach, let's look at who and how he acknowledges. So I have two friends that are working on their uh, advanced degrees. I've already mentioned one. Len is working on his Um, And you may uh, know that Wale completed his PhD just uh, recently, a PhD, and I don't understand what it was, but it was really technical. (laughs) But one of the things that I've learned is the importance for uh, a a researcher to cite and acknowledge sources. 
So they, as they write their paper and as you uh, identify other, other research, you need to footnote or endnote to put it into the bibliography. You probably have to follow some style, like the Turabian style, but there are specific ways that you need to uh, uh, give credit to uh, where credit is due in order to have uh, credibility in the academic community. If you, uh, if you don't do this, it's simply viewed as plagiarism or stealing. So who does Paul acknowledge in his letter? Let's look at verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Paul is acknowledging both the riches and the strength are through the Holy Spirit, not pulling himself up by his bootstraps, not by squeezing the lemon to get a little more juice out of it, but by calling and praying for God's strength and God's power. So uh, back to your bulletin and back to taking notes. So this is the second word you need to write down, and it is acknowledge. That's how it, kind of how it sounds when you spell it. Acknowledge, A-C-K-N-O-W-L-E-D-G-E. I think that's the first time in my life I've ever spelled it correctly. <laughs> Acknowledge. But if you'd write that down as your second word. Well, unfortunately, plagiarism is still alive and well in our culture. It's, uh, it was interesting when I was doing some uh, Google research on plagiarism, the amount of names that immediately pulled up that have been accused of plagiarism over the decades. Many well-known people, uh, Helen Keller, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Johnny Cash. Um, uh, there were several others in that list. One that just came out this past week was uh, one of our country music stars, uh, Carrie Underwood. She was accused of plagiarizing the Sunday night football theme song. You all know it, right? You know, everybody gets all excited when that comes out. But this is not unique to public figures. We are tempted as well. Instead of acknowledging God as the source of riches and strength, we want to take credit. Instead of acknowledging God as the great creator of the mountains, we name them after ourselves as if we had anything to do with them. We go and look at Long's Peak. Why is it not God's Peak? We, we didn't have anything to do with it. We just happened to stumble across this amazing creation. So let me introduce you to another version of the Bible um, that you may not be familiar with. I, I call it the uh, M M I V. It's the Me International Version. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. I think, at least I am. Um, in, when we look at Ephesians 3.16 in the Me International Version, we often try to rewrite it something like this. I pray that out of my riches and power, plus God's if we run a bit short, will strengthen us for our inner beings. Well, obviously, I hope that is absolutely wrong. That is not correct. It doesn't matter when we do this, we're going to say not correct. There we go. I just want to make sure. I don't want to get in trouble. It is God's glories and riches, not mine. So the question I have is, why is it so difficult? Why is taking credit for somebody, uh, someone else's work so tempting? It's pride. Well, would you guys play a little bit of a, a game with me this morning? And it's called the opposite game. It's, it's really not that complicated on rules. All I do is yell out a word, and then you, give, and then you yell out the opposite uh, meaning. So the first one is hot. All right. Up. Left. That was even confusing, because I wasn't sure if I should do my left or your left or my right or your left. Artificial real. Okay. Uh, north. South. Okay, I'm trying to get mine correct. Good. Broccoli. Pizza. Oh, I can't believe you guys didn't get it. Well, okay, one more time. Broccoli. So, yeah, you guys are good. Love. So let's look at uh, what uh, Corinthians says about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not boast. It does, oops, it does not envy. And it is not proud. Yes, hate is the opposite of love. But if you look at that, love is not proud. Hmm. Our culture often overlooks pride as a moral sin or moral failing. In fact, sometimes it's even embraced. We march in the streets 
declaring our pride and our orientation. We get bumper stickers on our car, pledging allegiance and pride to our favorite sports team. We show our school spirit by wearing our school colors to demonstrate our support and school pride. We even sometimes say we're proud parents. I realize that I'm poking a bit. I might have even pushed a little too hard, but I think it's worth poking. I think it's important that we examine the intersection of love and the intersection of pride in our lives. Are you filled with pride? Are you filled with acknowledgement? Capturing the power of a lightning bolt is not easy. It's gone in a flash. It's unpredictable. I wrote this not knowing that uh, it was going to be so stormy this afternoon. So if you really want to capture one, take a golf club, go to the top of Lookout Mountain, and stand there. And I am sure you will capture yourself a lightning bolt and probably make the evening news. But if we approach humbly and acknowledge God's power, how do we grasp it? How do we grab on to this seemingly uh, unattainable power? How do we hold on? Verse 17 says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love. Rooted in love. That's how we grasp God's power. By putting our hope in this love of Jesus Christ. So on your piece of paper or wherever you're taking notes, we have the third item to write down. And that is rooted. R-O-O-T-E-D, rooted. This isn't the first time the Bible has used uh, uh, plants as an illustration. Uh, for. Uh, for so when we look at the, uh, Matthew uh, chapter 1, you might remember, I am the vine, you are the branches. You look at Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and out of control. I mean, self-control. In Jeremiah 17, 8, it says, they will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. So let's look. What are the functions of roots? Why does a plant have roots? Well, first it's for the absorption of the water and the inorganic nutrients to bring the minerals, to bring the moisture up into the plant. Another function of it is to anchor the plant to the ground to provide something uh, for it to hold on to so that during the storm, during the cat storm or the adult storm knocking it over, that it has something to, uh, to grasp onto. Another one is for the storage of the food and for the nutrients. You know, Susie and I planted our, our garden up in our neighborhood garden plot this year and you know, it's fun to be able to put the sow the seed or uh, we cheated and used a few starter plants from Home Depot to get going, and we get the roots buried into the ground um, and uh, to establish uh, to, and to store those nutrients. You know, we planted carrots. It's kind of fun. Carrots actually, you know, literally, you eat the root. That's where the nutrients are stored, or the potato, or other similar root uh, vegetables. And then it's also the one I didn't uh, quite catch on to was the vegetative reproduction and competition and protection of the plant. Boy, does everybody have just absolutely green yards this year with all the rain and moisture. It's uh, been a great year for, uh, for my lawn. And if you notice, when your yard and your, uh, the grass is healthy, it is able to choke out any uh, root, I'm sorry, any uh, weeds from popping up because of the strong root system. It's also how it's spread. I put down some ground cover uh, in our backyard by, our, uh, by a, a little bit of a rock wall, and, and we, those spread and those roots try to protect from other uh, weeds and other plants coming upon it. So my question for you is, where are your roots? And I'm not talking about the 23 and Me. I'm not talking about looking back to where you're from, Ancestry.com. But where do you plant your spiritual roots? Well, that kind of seems a little bit esoteric. So maybe we should ask it this way. Where is your hope? Where do you find hope? Roots provide daily nutrients, hold you firm and protect us. What you do, what you grasp onto uh, just to make it through the day. Where do you establish your roots? 
For some in our society, the only way they can make it through the day is with a mind-altering chemical. Maybe that was poor timing. But in a more serious note, um, in my current job, uh, I work primarily with the first responder community. I work with police, fire, EMS. I love the... I love the way they describe themselves, guns, hoses, and needles. At many of the national public safety conferences, uh, the, they bring up their top concerns, the top issues uh, of the day, what is of concern. And at almost every conference, the opioid crisis comes up. Did you know that uh, 47,000 opioid, there was 47,000 opioid uh, overdoses in uh, 2017, that's more people than die in car accidents per year. That's uh, 130 people per day. Five people will die by the time the end of the, the service ends from an opioid-related uh, 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 um, overdose. It's all because they've placed their hope in a mind-altering chemical. They've rooted themselves in poison. This hope seems rather hopeless, if you ask me. I suggest that you have two responses to what I just went through with the opioid crisis. One of which, your heart sinks because there's somebody in my family, somebody that you know that's been impacted by this. With 11.4 million people um, misusing prescription pain medication uh, every day, that's about 3% of the U.S. population. That means that even here today that there's three or four or five people that probably are struggling with opioid addiction or misuse of painkillers. But your life has been touched, your life has been altered by this. Second, you might be breathing a sigh of relief in all seriousness going, I am so thankful that I haven't been impacted by this. I am so glad that I have not been stuck in this horrible uh, chemical addiction. Many people in our society, those that don't even follow Christ, will recognize the folly and danger of planting their roots in such a poison and chemical. But I suggest that there are some false hopes that many people in our community do place their hope in. So let's like take a look at a few of those. In these earthly soils, that's versus heavenly soils, we have people that uh, place their hope in academic success. If I get just the right grade, I can get just into the right school, I can get just the right scholarship, I can get just the right opportunity in my career. Their hope is found in their academic success. Second is those that find their hope in career advancement. I'm gonna work a few extra hours tonight, I'm gonna spend, uh, I'm gonna commit myself at, at, to my job to getting this done so that in the hopes I can get a raise, that I can get a promotion, and that I can find worth, I can get my name published, I can get my name, become uh, uh, my LinkedIn profile will get liked and searched upon. Another one is uh, financial abundance. This oftentimes comes after the academic and the uh, career advancement, that they find their hope in their uh, financial uh, uh, security. Has anybody ever heard of the FIRE movement? It stands for financially independent, retire early. It's been kind of a bit of a craze amongst uh, younger millennials as they work, uh, enter into the workforce. They're called super savers. They save 25, 30, 40, 50% of their annual income so that by the time they're 40 that they'll have financial independence so that they can go and live and do whatever they want, whether it's living in a van down by the river or whether that's living on a sailboat, whether that's uh, traveling the world, they get to have the opportunity to do what they want. They think that their security will be found and their hope will be found in financial abundance. Another one is societal status. This one is uh, pretty easy to see if you have uh, access to social media. If they're checking to see if their post has been liked, if their picture has been viewed, if there's been comments made to their story on their social media account. Uh, unfortunately, and I think it extends beyond that, we find people that will drive cars that they don't really care about just in the hopes that they'll be noticed. They wanna make a statement by the type of vehicle they have and uh, the type of uh, car they drive. And then the last I would call is individual indulgence. This is 
the idea that they're going to find hope and they're going to find uh, satisfaction in that next great vacation, the visit with Mickey Mouse, that trek across Europe, that uh, day at the golf course, that time of mountain biking up and down Lookout Mountain, which does not sound like an indulgence to me, but I'm glad you enjoy it. But those, they find that they, their purpose and hope is, if I can just make it through the week of work, I can get to that time of recreation, that time of self-indulgence. What is it for you? Is it your 401k? Is it your golf game? Is it your grandkids? Is it your cute dog? I could keep going. Eventually, I'm going to offend somebody, if I haven't already. Now, Garrett, where in the Bible does it say grandkids are sinful? Maybe I shouldn't answer that. Okay, where in the Bible does it say golfing is wrong? It wasn't even invented. At least I don't think so. Well, there's nothing wrong with golf or grandkids. There's nothing wrong with pensions or pets. The, when I say where your hope is and you, I, and you say your hope is in your golf game, suddenly it doesn't sound so hopeful, right? It sounds like maybe I'm, I haven't rooted myself in, in an eternal perspective. So where should we root ourselves? Well, obviously, it's the love of Christ. So let's look at verses 18 and 19. Is the love of Christ enough? It's overflowing. It surpasses knowledge. It is God-sized. It says, how wide High and deep and wide is the love of Christ. It's overflowing what's available. I don't know if you've been down to Clear Creek in the last uh, couple of weeks, but uh, you can see the water's pretty high. I don't think you can even uh, walk under um, the Washington Street Bridge. I think it's flooded. Is it right? Has anybody been down there lately? You have to do your best, uh, Peter, walking on water to get through it, right? When you stand next to the Clear Creek during this, uh, the runoff, it's, it's, uh, it's beautiful, it's overflowing, but it's also intimidating. Why is it so intimidating? Because it's powerful. It's beyond our control. So let's write down the last, uh, uh, last and final word, which is prayer. So we have approach, acknowledge, rooted in prayer. How does Paul root himself in the love of Christ? He calls out to God. He simply prays. When you look at uh, verses uh, 20 and 21, this is an awesome benediction. I'm going to repeat it again because I think it is worth hearing. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This quote I picked from John uh, Stott, I think really reflects well on um, where we're at with our prayer life. It says, one of the best ways to discover a Christian's chief anxieties and ambitions is to study the content of his prayers and the intensity with which he prays them. You have probably have heard the, the comment, if you want to see the priorities in somebody's life, look at their calendar. If you want to see the uh, things they value, look at their checkbook and where they spend their money. If you want to look and see what causes anxiety and what, where a, a Christian finds hope, look at their prayers. Listen to your prayers. Well, I work in uh, technical sales and have done that for the past several decades. And one of the things in sales and marketing is we never leave a meeting without establishing next steps. And next steps uh, often uh, can look uh, like uh, if we're having a technical issue, the next step is are we going to call another partner in? Are we going to get a technician to go out and look at what, how to fix the problem? If it's a sales call, we're, we end the meeting, and the next step is you know, engaging the attorney to work on the contract language or to talk to the pricing team to figure out what the price is. But we never walk out of that meeting with the next step. So I'm going to give you four next steps that you can take today. 
None of them involve lawyers or contracts, so that's the good news. <laughs> but um, maybe you're going to want to do one of them. Maybe you're going to want to do two. Maybe you're going to want to do all of them. But I would challenge you to think and incorporate one of these next steps this week. So the first one is maybe you ought to consider praying on your knees this week. Kneel when you pray. I know it's unusual. I know it's not something we commonly do. But I think it really hits the key of acknowledgement, that first A that we uh, looked at this morning. Second is, would you consider writing out one of your prayers? Would you consider authoring it really like Paul did? Writing it out, and it will help you think through your priorities. It will help think through where your hope comes from. Another third one, which is a root examination. Sounds a lot like a root canal. I promise it's not as painful. At least I hope not. But a root examination is reflect on where you've been putting your roots. Reflect on where you have your hope. Reflect on where you're getting uh, your nutrients, where you're getting uh, your, uh, your water from. Where are you being filled uh, from? And then last is I would encourage you to pray verses 20 and 21, the one I just read. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. If you pray it enough, you'll probably have it memorized by the end of the week, or even by the end of the day. But make that a part of your prayer routine. Uh, I think it will help change your perspective on the power of prayer in your life. Too often our prayers are centered around the thanksgiving for our food, the safe travels, the concern for the ill and for your loved ones. Those are great things to pray about. Keep praying about it. But pray about more than that. Pray about where your hope comes from. Look at the model prayer that uh, Paul provided. So um, our last and final slide is uh, the AARP. I want to take back the AARP. <laughs> The AARP, you know, and so when you go to the doctor's office and you pull out the magazine and you see the ad for the AARP or you hear the radio announcement or you get those things in the mail asking you to join, I think they start sending them out as soon as you turn 21, <laughs> trying to get you to join the AARP. But I want you to think every single time that this is a thing about hope. It's about my approach, what I acknowledge, what my roots are in my prayer. So I want you to rethink, ah, AARP is not some organization that's going to give me a discount at Denny's when I go the next time, but this is going to provide me a new perspective, a new way that I will engage um, and be refreshed in where I will find my roots and where I will find my hope. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come before you and are just thankful that you give us access and revelation through Paul's letter to, to the Ephesians. You clearly declared that our hope should only come through you. That you have more than enough power, more than enough riches, that our, the nutrients are sufficient from you. Lord, we confess that we root ourselves in so many things, so many things other than your love. Lord, we confess before you and ask you to uh, fill us this morning. Squeeze that other things out. Squeeze those weeds out of our lives. Reveal yourself to each of us this week. Thank you, Lord, that we can come before the holy God, the creator of the universe. In your son's name, amen.